Namaskaram. Today I'm going to be talking about verse 26 of, Uludu, of Upadesha India. Um, in verse 25, which we spoke about last time, uh, Bhagavan said, um, Tane Upadi Vitu Obadu, Tan Isan Tane uh, Unavadam Undipara, Tanai uh, Olivadal Undipara. That means uh, knowing oneself, leaving aside adjuncts, leaving aside adjuncts is very literal meaning, it implies without adjuncts. So knowing oneself without adjuncts is itself knowing God because of shining as oneself. That implies because God shines as oneself. That is what, what God shines, he's always shining in our heart as I am, as what we actually are. So if we know ourselves without adjuncts, that is knowing God, because uh, the only thing that seemingly separates ourselves from God, as he said in the previous uh, verse, is adjuncts. That in the previous verse he had said, Yurukam Iyakayal Isa Jivagal Oruporleyava Undipara Upadi Unavei Ver Undipara. That means uh, by their existing nature, God and soul are just one substance. Only adjunct awareness is different. That is, it's our only our awareness of adjuncts, our mistaking ourselves, to, our limiting ourselves as adjuncts by being aware of ourselves instead of just being aware of instead of being aware of ourselves as just I am. We're aware of ourselves as I am so and so. I am this body. I am this person. That adjunct awareness is what makes us seem to be uh, separate from God. But actually, in substance, we and God are one and the same thing. We are just that, uh, ex what he refers to here as irukumiya keva, the, the existing nature, that is our nature is just being. And that being or existence, which is our true nature, is also uh, what God actually is. So what we actually are is what God actually is. Therefore, knowing ourselves without adjuncts is knowing God. So, so having said, but knowing, having talked about knowing ourselves in the previous verse, in this verse, in verse 26, the verse we're talking about today, he clarifies what is meant by knowing oneself. What he says in this verse is, Tanai iritle tanai aridalam, tan irendatradal undipara, tan tanmaya nishte idundipara. Uh, what that means is, tanai iritli, tanai aridlam. Only being oneself, well, being oneself alone is knowing oneself. Tani uh, rendatridal, uh, because oneself is not uh, is not two. Or oneself is devoid of two. There's, there's no two-ness. We, we, we are one. So we cannot know ourselves as an object. Knowing ourselves is not one, one thing knowing another thing. We know ourselves just by being ourselves. Because what we actually are, as he, as he said in, um, in verse 23, um, what we actually are is just awareness. In verse 23, he said, um, uh, uh, Uludu Unara Unavu Verin Mayin, uh, Uludu Unavahum Undipara, uh, uh, Unave Namai Ulam Undipara. Uh, what that means is because of the non existence of any awareness other than what is to know what is, what is is awareness. Uh, and then he concludes by saying, awareness alone exists as we. That is. What we actually are is only awareness. Um, so since we are awareness, we don't have to do anything to know ourselves. We can know ourselves only by being ourselves. That is, by being as we actually are, we are thereby knowing ourselves as we actually are. Um, so this verse is, uh, is a very key verse. In, well, it's, it's a very... Uh, key teaching of Bhagavan, but it's also very key in this particular text in Upadesha India. Because if we, if we, 
review all the verses in Upanishadiya, Bhagavan begins by talking about karma. Um, in the first verse, he says, uh, karma means action. In the first verse, he says, um, uh, action giving fruit is by uh, the ordainment of God. Action is Jada, therefore action, can action be God? Obviously, action is not God. Action is something Jada. Uh, so since it's, it, it's Jada, it's got no power of its own. It's only uh, by, uh, by the uh, power of God that action gives fruit. And that God selects which, ag- which fruit are appropriate for which action. And when is the best time for it? There's time and circumstances for us to experience the fruit of any action. So no action can give fruit of its own accord. It's only by the ordainment of God. But then the the next verse, a really crucial verse, is verse 2. In verse 2, he says, he starts by saying, um, um, I'll just get the verse because it's uh, the wording is very important here. He starts off with a um, with an adverbial clause, which is "vinayim uh, vilevu uh, vilevu tru." Uh, uh, what that means is the fruit of our action perishing. What that implies is the fruit of actions are not permanent. When we if the actions we do the bear fruit are finite actions, so the fruit is also finite. When we experience the fruit of an action, that fruit is thereby perishes. That is, once we've consumed the, or, or eaten the fruit of, of any particular action, that fruit is, uh, is thereby um, becomes not non-existent. It no longer exists. Just like uh, a physical fruit, a mango or an orange or an apple or a grape or any other fruit, we can only eat it once. We can't eat the same fruit twice. Uh, so um, experience, that is our prarabdha, what we are destined to experience in this lifetime, is all just as uh, uh, a set of fruit of actions that we've done in the past. So this set of fruit that we are to experience in this lifetime, once we experience each particular fruit, that fruit has thereby perished. It no longer is there. It cannot give uh, fruit again. Um, so what we have to infer from the previous verse is that once we do an action, the fruit is out of our hands. It's then up to God when we experience the fruit. And when we experience the fruit, the fruit is therefore finished. Therefore, we need not be concerned about the fruit of action because it's completely out of our hands once we once you've shot an arrow from a bow this is a classic example once you've shot the arrow from a bow you no longer have um you no longer have control over the arrow where where what it's going to hit and how it's going to hit it it's all it's out of your hands and likewise with action once we've done an action then the fruit is in god's hands it's up to him when when and where and how we should experience that fruit. Um, so the fruit of action perishes. So the fruit of action is not the problem. The problem is when we do an action, it has two, there are two types of consequences. One is the fruit. The fruit means what we are to experience as a consequence of that action. If you do a good action, uh, you, you, the fruit of that action will be some pleasurable experience. If you do a bad action, uh, good or bad, here means morally good or bad. Um, that's not according to the morality decided by society, but in a, but the morality, God, God alone can judge what action is good and what action is bad. And uh, so, the good actions will bear good fruit and the bad actions will bear bad fruit. But good fruit means some pleasurable experience. Bad fruit means some unpleasant experience. Um, uh, that's one type of uh, consequence of an action. That's it. We can say the moral consequences of the action of a fruit. But there's another, uh, the, the more serious problem is when we do an action, the more we do any particular type of action, the more we are cultivating an inclination to do that type of action. So that 
inclination to do that type of action is what is called here as seed. This is the seed, it is the seeds that cause us to fall in the ocean of action, as he says in the next in the main clause of this first sentence. Um, Vitae uh, vine cuddle virtidum, as seeds causes us to fall in the ocean of action. These seeds are what are called vasanas. Um, vasanas means our in inclinations. So the inclinations to act are what causes us to fall in the ocean of action. The inclinations to act are called karma vasanas. But Bhagavan generally, he, that is, he, he's referring to karma vasanas, we can say, but generally Bhagavan talked about vishaya vasanas. What is the connection between karma, a karma vasana and a vishaya vasana? Well, it's very simple. Whatever action we do, we, we do action in order to experience some, uh, some, uh, result, some, some vishaya. Vishaya means a, uh, an object or a phenomena. So in order to experience something, some, we, we always want to experience pleasurable things. So in order to experience something that we find pleasant, we do the action. So the, the, the inclination to experience vishayas is what is called vishaya vasana. The inclination to, do actions is what is called karma vasana. Every karma vasana is motivated by a vishaya vasana. That is, we do the action in order to experience some vishaya. So um, we can say, uh, to, to give an analogy, we can say the karma vasana is like the outer shell of a seed, but the vishaya vasana is the inner, the, the, the actual the germ of the seed, what, what is actually going to sprout, it's, it's, it's the, that is what, what gives life to that uh, karma vasana is the vishaya vasana. So if, uh, if the vishaya vasana dies, the karma vasana will die along with it. Because if, well, if, we, if we don't want, if we have no inclination to experience a particular uh, uh, vishaya, We'll have no inclination to do an action in order to experience it. So actions, we can say, are the, the, the grosser form of the vishaya vasana, the slightly grosser form of the vishaya vasana. Um, so, but, so the seeds here specifically refers to vishaya vasana, but by, by implication, it refers to the Sorry, it explicitly is referring to the karma vasana in this context, but in by implication, it, it is referring to the vishaya vasanas. So the more we do actions, we do actions in order to experience vishayas, the more we do those actions, the more the inclination to do those actions and the inclination to experience that vishaya will uh, increase. So this is why Bhagavan says it's the seeds that cause us to fall in the ocean of action. And then he concludes by saying, um, uh, vidu tarile. Uh, that means it is not giving liberation. That means action does not give liberation. Why does action not give liberation? Because the fruit, actions are finite. So the fruits of action are finite. Liberation is not something finite. It is what, what is eternal and infinite. It is our real nature. So finite actions cannot give the, the infinite result of liberation. So action cannot give, um, uh, cannot give liberation. That's one reason. Another reason is liberation is our real nature. Our real nature is not doing but only being. That is what we actually are is just sat, chit, ananda. Sat means pure being. Chit means pure awareness. Ananda means pure happiness. That is what we actually are. So our real nature is not doing anything but just being. Uh, so, we, since liberation is nothing but the annihilation of ego and thereby uh, the attainment, so to speak, we, it's, not, it's not really an attainment because it's always ours, but by shedding the ego, we seem to attain what, what we always actually are. Um, so, since, um, since liberation is, is our real nature, which is just being, being cannot be brought about by doing. That is the, uh, the deeper implication of this verse. So Bhagavan begins Upadesha India by making it clear that 
no amount of doing can give liberation. So, uh, so how, then the question naturally arises: Then what can I do if I can't, if no action will uh, give me liberation? How can I attain liberation? What must I do? So long as the mind is gross and outward going, we think only in terms of doing. So for that gross outward going mind, Bhagavan says in the next verse. Kartanu kakum nishkaramiya karma, karate tiriti akdundi para, gati vari kambi komundi para. What that means is, nishkaramiya uh, karma means desireless action. That means action that is not motivated by desire for, you don't do the action in order to experience some particular result, some particular fruit. So that is what is meant by nishkaramiya. Uh, karma means desire. Uh, uh, karmiya means uh, motivated by desire. Nishkarmiya means not motivated by desire. So nishkarmiya karma, uh, he qualifies that as kartanukakam, done for God. That, yeah, that implies done for the love of God. Because actions are always have some motive. So if we're not motivated by desire for some fruit, what are we motivated by? Only by this, by love for God. So desireless action, uh, uh, karate tiriti. Uh, tiriti literally means rectifying, but it implies in this context purifying. Purifying the mind or rectifying the mind. Uh, it, it will show the way to liberation. That is, yeah. No amount of desireless action can give liberation. No, no action can give liberation. Not even desireless action can give liberation. But if a desireless, if we do desire action desirelessly and motivated by love for God, then it will purify the mind and show the path to liberation. What does that mean? But what are the impurities in the mind first? If the impurities in the mind are nothing but the vasanas, the Bhagavan referred to in, as seeds in the previous verse. So the, the impurities in our mind are our vasanas. Uh, that is particularly the vishaya vasanas and the karma vasanas. So uh, purifying the mind means uh, reducing the strength and intensity of our vishaya vasanas. But the more the vishaya vasanas are weakened, and the the the, the contrary of vish, the, the opposite of vishaya vasana is sat vasana. Sat vasana means the inclination just to be. So as as the vishaya vasanas um, are weakened, the sat vasana is strengthened. Um, so uh, that can be achieved by desireless action done for God. But what is important to understand in this context, it's not the action per se that purifies the mind. It's the love with which the action is done. Though Bhagavan doesn't explicitly mention love in this verse, when he says done for God, the implication is done for the love of God. And in the Malayalam version of this verse, he says, uh, Ishwara Priti and I, that means for the love of God. Done for the love of God. So um, the, the implication here is uh, is that uh, 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 desireless action, if it's done for the love of God, will purify the mind, um, uh, and it will thereby show the way to liberation. How will it show the way to liberation? So long as our mind is full of impurities, that is, if so long as the vishaya vasanas are and karma vasanas are strong, the mind will be outward going. And the outward going mind can think only in terms of doing, of action. So it's always looking for something to do. Only when the mind is purified will it understand that uh, liberation is our own real nature. So we can attain liberation not by doing anything, but just by being as we actually are. But to, uh, in order to understand and to accept that the mind requires a certain degree of purity. Um, another important point to mention here, often it is talked about four yogas, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, uh, uh, raja yoga, 
that means Patanjali's yoga, uh, uh, pranayama and so on, and jnana yoga. Jnana yoga means the chara of a part that one has taught us. Um, and bhakti, bhakti, uh, the culmination of bhakti is surrender, which is itself jnana. So generally, uh, um, karma yoga and bhakti yoga, or the path of karma and the path of bhakti, are taken to be two separate paths. Bhagavan makes it clear here, it is not so. That is the nish, the, the, the nish, that is the, uh, karma, so called, what is called karma yoga is only nishkarmiya karma. And action can be genuinely nishkarmiya only to the extent to which it is done for the love of God. So, uh, so the, what is the relationship between the path of bhakti and the path of uh, nishkarmiya karma? At the initial stages of the path of bhakti, we do things to express our love for God. Those actions that we do, as an expression of our love for God, that is karma yoga. So he, he then goes on in the next verse to talk about um, what are the different types of action that we can do um, to express our love for God. And he says, um, this is certain, puja, japa, and dhyana, puja means um, uh, worship, japa means repetition, and dhyana means meditation. Uh, these three are actions of body, speech, and mind. Um, implication there, respectively. That is, puja is an action of a body. Japa is an action of speech. Dhyana is an action of mind. And then he says, vivu ahum ondril ondru. Uh, that implies, what that literally means is, um, uh, one than one is superior. Right? The implication is, but um, but actions we do by speech are superior to actions we do by body, and actions we do by mind are superior to actions we do by uh, speech. What in what sense is it superior? That is the context in which Bhagavan uh, is talking here. In the previous verse, he talked about purification of the mind. So uh, there's, it's superior in the sense that it is more effective in purifying the mind. So if, for example, we do puja, puja can be, um, it can be ritualistic worship, or it can be, you can express your love for God by doing service to other people or to any sentient beings, or animals or anything. So there are various ways we can do puja, but they're all actions of the body. These are less effective in purifying the mind than actions done by speech, because speech is a, is a subtler, um, instrument of action than the body. So, um, uh, so, so sp the actions done by speech are more effective in purifying the mind than actions done by body. So, P Japa is superior to Puja in that sense. And actions done by the mind are superior to actions done by, uh, speech. Uh, so the most purifying of the actions done by mind. Um, and then he goes on in the fifth verse, he describes different, uh, what is worshipping God? Worshipping all the eight forms um, or, or worshipping, considering that all the eight forms are forms of God, is good uh, worship of God, good puja of God. Um, um, uh, the eight forms means uh, um, it, there's sometimes the, the, that is, Shiva is considered to be Ashtamurti, composed of eight forms, and those eight forms are eight manifestations. And namely the five elements, um, earth, water, fire, air, and space. And uh, yeah, the other three are uh, sometimes classified slightly differently, but generally it means uh, sun, moon, and sentient beings, jivas. So considering that any or all of these eight forms are forms of God, worshipping them uh, is, is good worship of God. Um, so generally people take karma yoga to me or, or a modern understanding of karma yoga, very superficial understanding is that doing, doing service to, uh, to people or to animals, that is karma yoga. Yes, that is karma yoga in the sense that if you take the 
uh, sentient beings, whether human or non-human, that you are serving to be God, that will purify your mind. So if you're if you're helping uh, people or animals with the attitude, but um, with with the idea that they are forms of God. Um, uh, that will purify your mind, but that's less effective than Japa, uh, as he implied in the previous verse. Then in verse six, he goes on to talk about Japa, and um, he says, rather than praising, that means rather than singing uh, stotras, um, doing Japa in a loud voice is better. Rather than doing Japa in a loud voice, doing Japa within the mouth. That means uh, softly doing the Japa within the mouth, and better than doing doing within the mouth is uh, doing it by mind. Uh, um, and uh, doing japa by mental japa, like maniska japa, that is called dhyana, that is called meditation. So that is what Bhagavan is pointing out is the, the subtler and subtler an action is, the more effective it is in purifying the mind. Then in verse 7, he talks about uh, dhyana, the last of the uh, um, of the, uh, the actions that we can do, the action that we do by mind. And there he says, rather than meditating interruptedly, meditating uninterruptedly, like the, like a river or the uh, falling of ghee, is superior to meditate. That is, why this is so, if you, if you have love for God, you, and you're meditating on God, because of the strength of your love, you'll be able to keep your mind fixed on God. But if your mind is often distracted by thoughts about other things, that means you're more interested in those other things than you are in God. So uh, the, the steadiness and, and uh, constancy of the meditation is, um, is, a, is an indication of the degree of love that we have for God. Here, meditating means meditating on God, meditating on a name or form of God. Um, so these are all actions. So long as we take God to be something other than ourselves, when we meditate on him, we can only med if God is something other than him, ourself, he's then a, a name and form. So meditating on a name and form of God is still an action because it mean, entails an, a movement of our attention away from ourselves towards other things. So up to verse 7, Bhagavan has been talking about action. And he said that by doing the action with, without desire, but with love for God, that will purify the mind and show the way to liberation. But if the way to liberation is not an action, then what is it? That we, is uh, made clear by Bhagavan in the next two verses. What he says in verse 8 is, um, this is where where the, where the bhakti marga merges into jnana marga. He says, rather than anya bhava, certainly ananya bhava, in which he is I, is the best among all. Anya bhava, anya means what is other. So in this context, anya bhava means meditating on God as something other than ourself. So better than meditating on God as something other than ourself, ananya bhava, that means Ananya means what is not other. So meditating on God does not have a oneself is the best among all. And then he, he, um, he further clarifies what he means by Ananya Baba by saying, Avanahamahum Ananya Baba. That means Ananya Baba in which he is I. That is when we recognize, when we are willing to accept that God is that which is shining in our heart as I, what is the best way to meditate on God? Only to meditate on I. That is to meditate on ourself. So meditating on ourself is what he meant by an Ananya Baba. In other words, it is Atma Vichara. It is self, self investigation. And that Bhagavan says it is the best among all. In what sense is it best? In the context, he's been talking about each practice being superior to the previous practice. He's it is the best among all in the sense that it is the most purifying of all actions. In that's what he is meant in this context. So the best among all, all here can mean all types of action. Uh, it can mean all practices of bhakti. It can mean uh, any sport among all spiritual practices, 
meditating on nothing other than oneself, that is the best, that is the most effective means to purify the mind. Not only, he doesn't say it here, but uh, we can understand, we can understand from what he's taught us elsewhere, not only is uh, self-attentiveness or uh, Ananya Bhava the most uh, uh, effective means to purify the mind, it is also the only means by which we can uh, eradicate the root of all impurities. The impurities of the vasanas. Whose vasanas are they? They're only my vasanas. That, that me who, who has vasanas is ego. So ego is the root of all vasanas. So the, the, the purification of the mind can be, can be complete only when ego is eradicated. Because only when ego is eradicated will all, vasa, all its vasanas be eradicated. Until then, we can, we can weaken our vishaya vasanas and strengthen our, our, our sat vasana, but we cannot eradicate all vasanas without eradicating ego, because ego is the root of all vasanas. And it's the very nature of ego to have the share of vasanas. So though we can reduce the extent or the strength of the share of vasanas, we cannot eradicate them entirely without eradicating ego. So this ananya bhava, self-attentiveness, is the only means, it's the most effective means to weaken the share of vasanas, and it's the only means to eradicate their root, namely ego. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. Um, up, as I say, up to verse seven, he's been talking about action, but he he's talking about Ananya Baba. So, is Ananya Baba another type of action? It is not, because attending to anything other than ourself is an action, because it entails a movement of our mind away from ourselves towards some other thing. Whereas Ananya Bhava, self-attentiveness, is not an action, it is a cessation of all action. Because to the extent to which we attend to ourselves, to that extent does ego subside. And where does ego subside? Only in our natural state of just being. This is what is implied by Bhagavan in the next verse, verse 9. What he says in verse 9 is, Bhavala Bhava Balatinal Bhava Natita Sat Bhava Tirutale Undipara Parabhakti Tattavum Undipara. What that means is by the strength of meditation. What is the meditation he's referring to here? It's the meditation he talked about in the previous verse, namely Ananya Bhava. In other words, the medita what he refers to here as Bhava is Ananya Bhava, which is means self-attentiveness. So by the strength of self-attentiveness, being in Sat Bhava. Sat Bhava means the state of being. So by the strength of, of that self-attentiveness, being in Sat Bhava, which transcend, uh, which is Bhavana Tita. Bhavana Tita means it transcends all Bhavana. Bhavana means meditation in the sense of thinking, imagining, or that meditating on anything other than ourselves is a bhavana, in, in the sense in which Bhagavan is using the term bhavana here. So, um, the, the being in that state of sat bhava, of just being, uh, it transcends all, all bhavana. In other words, it transcends all mental activity, and that alone, or that certainly, is parabhakti tattva. That is the nature of supreme devotion. That is what supreme devotion actually is. So if uh, and when we when we attend to ourselves so keenly that we remain in the state of Sat Bhava, that is we remain in the state of Sat Bhava only to the extent that ego subsides. And ego subsides only to the extent that we are self-attentive. And the subsidence of ego is what is otherwise called surrender. So being in Sat Bhava is giving ourselves to God. It's complete surrender to God. That's why Bhagavan says it is Parabhakti Tattva. It is the very nature of supreme devotion. So the greatest devotion is not to attend to any name or form of God, only to attend to the reality of God, which is that which is shining in our heart as I. And by clinging to that, clinging to I, we thereby bring about a subsidence of ego or mind and we remain in Satbhava, the state of being. 
so here we, we can see in these, in these nine verses, Bhagavan is slowly leading us from action to being. As I said earlier, being is our, our true nature. Our real nature, Atmasvarupa or Brahman or whatever we call it, its nature is not doing, its nature is just being. So, um, um, uh, we, in order to, uh, to return to our real nature, we need to cease doing and come to the state of just being. That's why the ultimate teaching is summa iru. That is, uh, uh, what is the ultimate practice? It is just being. Bhagavan often said, uh, liberation or atmasakshaka or moksha or whatever you, it's called is not attained by doing anything, but only by just being. And how can we just be? Bhagavan has made it clear in these two verses, eight and nine. We, it's only by the strength of, by the bhava, uh, uh, balam, that is the strength of, of meditation. Here, as I say, strength of meditation means the strength of self-meditation, meditating on ourselves. So it's only by the, the strength, the intensity, firmness, and stability of our self-attentiveness that we can just be. We can remain in the state of just being. And that state of just being, that is the supreme devotion. That is uh, the, uh, what Bhagavan referred to in verse uh, 2 when he said, it will show the way to liberation. The way to liberation is not doing, but just being. Um, so uh, one of the central themes running throughout Upadesha India is it is not by doing anything, but only by being that we can know what we, we can know what we actually are. And then in verse 10, he he wraps up the he summarizes the previous ten previous nine verses. And also the subsequent verses by saying, Udita idyatil or dungi irital adu karamum bhaktiyum undipara adu yoga jnanamum undipara. What that means is, Udita um, idyatil, uh, in the place of rising, that is, in the place from which we rise as ego. What, from where do we rise as ego? Only from Brahman, only from Atmasarupa, only from what we actually are, from our real nature, we rise as ego. So that our real nature, that pure awareness I am, that is the, the place of rising. Uh, Odungi means subsiding. Uh, irital means being. Uh, irital is a, um, a verbal noun. Odungi is a, uh, an adverbial participle. So it implies Subsidingly being, or we can say, uh, subsiding, or in other words, subsiding and being in the place from which we rose. In other words, uh, just being in our real nature as Brahman, as, as, uh, as, um, being, being, at, being in the place from which we rose, being, being as we actually are. Uh, that is, uh, the, 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 the pinnacle of, uh, yes, the culmination of karma and bhakti, of yoga and jnana. So all these four paths, uh, you, we, are, we are achieving the, the aim of all these four paths just by being so keenly self-attentive that we thereby subside and remain in the place from which we rose. Um, so this is the main aim of Bhagavan's teachings, is, and, and particularly in Upadesha India, Bhagavan is, is what, but the, the central message of Upadesha India, it's not by doing, only by being that we can know what we actually are. So Bhagavan has very, um, in a very subtle manner, he has made this clear in these first 10 verses. Um, and then verses 11 to 15, that's about the path of yoga. Uh, that also, Bhagavan says in verse 14, he makes it clear, to bring about the destruction of the mind, it is necessary to send the, it is necessary to send the mind on all vari. All vari, all can be taken, can mean one, but in this context, the primary meaning of all is, all means, is, is a verb that means, 
to investigate or to know. So all worry is a part of investigation. In other words, it implies the path of self-investigation. So it's only by sending the mind on the path of self-investigation that normally the mind is going outwards. We have to send that mind back within on this path of self-investigation. Only when we uh, do so uh, will its form, uh, will the mind die, will the form of the mind die. And then in verse 15, when he talks about that state in which the mind has died, he says, um, manavuru maya, maya, my manam maya, sorry, manavuru maya, my manam maya yogi, tanako sayalile undipara, tanil sandana undipara. Um, here again, Bhagavan has given us some very nice clues. Um, he said, manavuru, that means the form of the mind, maya, here is a um, the, in Tamil. There's a verb. Um, my uh, um, actually, he used the verb in um, in verse thirteen. Also, I think. Um, um, uh, yes, if if it's um, if its form dies, it will it will not rise. That implies if it's in NASA, if the mind's in NASA, it will not rise again. And in verse 13, he said, um, the, the dissolution of mind is of two kinds, layer and NASA. Layer is temporary dissolution, NASA is destruction or permanent dissolution. And then he says, what is lying down in layer will rise. So whenever the mind subsides in layer, sooner or later it will rise again. If its form dies in NASA, it will not rise. So the w verb he uses here for um, uh, for uh, die is uh, my mind. Uh, so uh, my my means to die. So here, when he says manavu maya, uh, it means when the form of the mind dies or when the form of the mind is annihilated. Um, uh, my yogi tanaku for the great yogi um uh also may manna my yogi uh, tanaku for the great yogi who uh who um who manna means to remain permanently or to be permanently may at the reality uh there is not a sing uh uh tan um or sail il or sail ilve there is not a single uh, action or doing. Tani uh, Sandanan, he's attained his nature. What that means is when the, when the mind has died by means of self investigation, by means of self attentiveness, for the great yogi who thereby remains as uh, the reality, mannam means being permanent. So that, that conveys the sense of being. There's not a single doing. That is, there's nothing to be done. There's no that all doing comes to an end when we subside in the state in our real state of just being. So Bhagavan again is emphasizing here: the, the path is not doing, but only being. And in the goal, the goal is only being, not doing. So it is Bhagavan. The whole message of Upanishad is emphasizing. But we need to be, not we need, it's not what we do, it's by just being. And how to just be? Only by self-attentiveness. Then in verse 16 onwards, he starts talking more about this, um, this how to bring about the subsidence of the mind, only by uh, investigating it. How to bring about the permanent dissolution of mind, only by investigating it. So he, 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 uh, he, expounds that path of self-investigation more in verse, from verses 16 onwards. In verse 16, he says, leaving external objects for mind knowing its own form of light alone is real awareness. Leaving external objects means not allowing our mind to go out towards anything else. When we allow our mind to go out towards anything else, the movement of our attention away from ourselves towards other things is action. So if we're not allowing the mind to go outwards, but we're using mind only to know our own form of light, our own form of light means that fundamental awareness I am. So knowing our own form of light is not an action, it's a state of just being. So leaving external phenomena, in other words, refraining from going outwards, refraining from rising to do any action, 
knowing what we actually are, and therefore by, by implication means being what we actually are, that alone is uh, unmayunichi, that alone is real awareness. Then in verse 17, he says, um, Manati nurve maravadu chava manumena mondrile undipara makum neragum undipara. When one investigates the form of the mind, the form of the mind here means the essential form of the mind. That is what the mind essentially is, as he clarifies in the next um, uh, verse, um, what the mind essentially is. The over mind is, we often use the term mind as a collective name for all thoughts. Of all the thoughts, the most the basic thought, of, uh, the, the primary thought is the thought I. So what the mind essentially is, is the thought I. So what he refers to here is the form of the mind. He means that that a video, that primal form of the mind, namely the thought called I, in other words, ego. So when one investigates ego without forgetting, Maravadu means forgetting means when we forget, if we under, if we begin a, some undertaking and then forget what we're doing, we, we, we stop doing that thing. So we need to investigate ourselves so keenly that we don't let go of that self-attentiveness. That's what's meant here by Maravadu, without forgetting. So if we do so, manamena mondrile, there's no such thing as mind. Um, there's not anything called mind. That, that what that implies is if we investigate ourselves keenly enough, we will find there is no such thing as mind. This is we, we can illustrate this with a, a, a simple analogy. If we see a rope but mistake it to be a snake, how to how can we how can we kill that snake? We can't actually kill the snake because it's not a snake at all. The only way we can get rid of the snake is by keenly um, is by keenly uh, attending to it. If we look at if we look at the snake very carefully, what do we see? Oh, it's not a snake; it's only a rope. Likewise, if we look at ego very carefully, we'll see there's no such thing as ego or mind at all. What is there is only pure awareness. That is, the pure awareness I am is what now seems to be mind or ego because of the mixture of adjuncts. Um, so, and as I say, here he talks about the form of the mind. The form of the mind, uh, he, what he means by the form of the mind, he clarifies in the next verse. In the next verse, he says, uh, thoughts alone are mind. In other words, generally when we use the term mind, we're referring to thoughts collectively. But enengle uh, manam, um, uh, yavinam nanenam enname mulamam. Yanam manam en uh, mulamam undipara, yanam manam enal undipara. So um, thoughts alone are mind of all, meaning of all thoughts, nanenam enname mulamam. The thought called I is a root. What he uh, describes here as the thought called I is ego. So why is ego the root? Why is the thought called I the root? Because all other thoughts are jada. They are no, they have no, they're not endowed with awareness. They're not aware of their own existence. They're not aware of the existence of anything else. They are objects. They are the shares. What is aware of all objects is only the subject. The subject is ego, the thought called I. So of all the thoughts, the, the root thought is ego because it's only in the view of ego that all other thoughts seem to exist. When we don't raise as ego in sleep, no other thoughts exist. When we rise as ego and waking and dream, in our view, so many other thoughts exist. And what Bhagavan means by here by thought is not just um, not just verbal thoughts or mental chatter. Uh, Bhagavan uses the term thought to include all phenomena, because according to Bhagavan, all phenomena are mental phenomena. So the term thought means mental phenomena of all kinds. Um, so that's thoughts, feelings, perceptions, memories, uh, uh, likes, dislikes, dislikes, everything is all thoughts. So all these thoughts, and, and because perceptions are only thoughts, um, are only mental phenomena, the whole world is nothing but thoughts, according to Bhagavan, as he says in Nana, in the, um, in the fourth paragraph of Nana, and again he repeats it in the 
uh, 14th paragraph of Nana. So thought, the, the world is nothing but thought. Why? Because the world, what we call the world, as he says in verse 6 of Uludinapadu, the world is nothing but the five kinds of sense perception. Uh, that is sight, sounds, uh, um, uh, uh, tactile sensations, tastes, and smells. If you take away these, where is there any world? The world is nothing but these five kinds of sense perception. And these five kinds of sense perception are nothing but mental phenomena. It's, it's the sights are, it's in the mind that we, that we perceive sights and uh, sounds and so on. So it's all mental. Therefore, when Bhagavan talks about thought, he's talking about, it's a, he's referring to phenomena of all kinds whatsoever. And the root of all phenomena is only ego, because it's only in the view of ego that all other thoughts seem to exist. Um, so he concludes this uh, verse by saying, Manameno Yanam. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, he says, Yanam Manameno. Uh, Yan means I. Um, is, uh, manam is mind, and enal, enal means saying, but he, he uses enal here in the sense of enbudu. What is called mind is, uh, is, is I. In other words, what the mind essentially is, is just ego, the first, the root thought called I. Um, so, so what we, when we have to investigate the form of a mind, it is this ego, this I that we have to investigate. And um, this, what is this ego? It's nothing but a mixed, it's nothing but an adjunct mixed form of self awareness. Instead of being aware of ourselves as just I am, we're aware of ourselves as I am Michael, or I am Kumar, or I am whoever. That Michael or Kumar, that is a name given to a body. So we are referring to ourselves as a body or as a person. We, because we now mistake ourselves to be a body. We, we now feel I'm sitting here, I'm seeing, I'm hearing, I'm, um, I'm, I'm thinking about what's being said. We are identifying ourselves with these five sheaves. Uh, body, life, mind, intellect, and will. These five sheaves we, is what we take to be ourselves. So, so long as we, Take this to be ourselves. We're not aware of ourselves as we actually are. So, uh, the, what the ego is, is nothing but this adjunct mixed awareness. What is real in ego is only the fundamental awareness I am. So, when, when we investigate the nature of ego, it is the I am portion of ego. As Bhagavan says in, it's been recorded in, um, in Maharshi's Gospel, in one place, Bhagavan says, when you invest in your investigation into the source of the Aham Vritti, it is the, it is the essential chit aspect of the mind you're investigating. Because what is the source of Aham Vritti? Aham Vritti is just another term, another name for the thought called I or ego. What is the source of uh, ego? Only our real nature. That is only, um, only that such it is a source. So when Bowen said when you're investigating the source, it's the essential chit aspect of ego that we are investigating. So it, it's the it's not the it's not the adjunct portion, it's what is the what is what are those adjuncts mixed up with? Only that with that fundamental awareness I have, that is what we need to investigate. Um, so all these verses I think, are clarifying what is this part of the investigation. That is, he, in verse 8, he referred to the part of self-investigation as Ananya Bhava. In verse 14, he referred to it as Ananya Bhava means meditating what is not other. In verse 14, he referred to it as Orvari, the part of investigating. So in these verses, he's clarifying what is this practice. Right? We are, we are to investigate not other thoughts, only this first thought I. And if in this first thought I, it's the I am portion that we are investigating. All this is implied in these verses. Then in verse 19, he, he goes, uh, uh, he goes further into, uh, I mean, he goes deeper into his practice. He says, um, uh, nan endu erum idum edu ena nadovu, uh, nan talai saindidum undi para, jnana vicharam idundi para. That means, um, when one investigates, uh, 
uh, within, all the rooms within, uh, what, what the place is from which one rises as I. Um, so what is the place from which we rise as I? It's only from ourselves, from our real nature, uh, from that Satchit. It's only from Satchit that we rise. It's only from I am. I am in Satchit. It's only from I am that we rise as I am this or I am that. That is when we're in sleep, what remains in sleep? Only we remain in sleep. We are not aware of anything other than our own existence, I am in sleep. But we, in waking and dream, we rise as ego. So from where do we rise as ego? Only from what exists in sleep, which is ourself, that the fundamental awareness I am. Uh, so when Bhagavan talks about investigating the place from which we rise as I, he's talking about investigating that fundamental awareness I am. That's why he says, uh, he concludes this verse by saying, this is jnana vichara. Jnana vichara, jnana means awareness. So it's, it's that chit, chit, the chit in sat chit. So when we investigate the, uh, the chit in sh sat chit, that is jnana vichara. So uh, what he said in the previous sentence, sorry, I don't think I finished it. When one investigates uh, within, what is the place from which one rises as I? Nantale uh, Saindidam. That literally means uh, I will bend its head. Uh, that's a, an, a, an idiomatic way of saying uh, I will die. Like in English, we've got various idioms. We talk about, um, we say, um, or uh, we talk about someone kicking the bucket. Kicking the bucket, <laughs> whenever we say kicking the bucket, it means they passed away. Or sometimes even more colloquial, they say, oh, he's croaked. That means he's, he's breathed his last. So there's so many, in all languages, there are colloquial ways of talking about dying. Uh, a colloquial way of talking about dying in Tamil is to say talai saindinam. So Bowen uses this very, um, in, in this, because, uh, because of the poetry, he uses this very colloquial uh, term to talk about that. Uh, Nantale Sainderam. That means I will die. Literally, it means I will bend its head, but it, it implies I will die. So, how will I die? Only when we investigate the place from which I has risen. What is the place from which I has risen? Only ourself, that fundamental awareness I am. And this is Jnana Vichara. This is, uh, this is investigating that awareness that we actually are, this Atma Vichara. Jnana Vichara, Atma Vichara, they're synonyms. Because Jnana, jnana is what we actually are. Jnana means pure awareness. Um, then in verse 20, he says, um, in the place where I emerge, uh, uh, I'll read in Tamil, um, nan onju tana tu, nan enju uh, onju, tana uh, onjadu, uh, tana hatondrame undipara, tana adupundramam undipara. In the place where I emerges, the I emerges is ego. In the place where I emerges, that the one appears spontaneously as nan nan. I am I. Adu adu tan adu pundramam. That means adu tan pundramam. That itself is the whole. Um, or Tanadu can mean uh, that oneself is the whole, but it, it, we can take it either way. Um, so when ego merges, something appears spontaneously. That is, ego is the false awareness. I am this or I am that. I am this body. I am this person called so and so. Uh, that is, that is ego. That is a false identi identity. That is not our real identity. What is our real identity? Our real identity is only I. So Bhagavan expresses our real identity by saying, Nan, Nan, I am I. That implies I'm nothing other than I. I'm only I. Um, uh, so in the state in which we're only I, that's not a state of doing, that's a state of being. He's not explicitly talking about um, uh, 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 not doing here, but it's implied in all these verses. Um, and then in verse 21, he, he says, um, Nananam sopporul amadu nalame, nanatutukutum undipara, namadimme nikatal undipara. 
That means that is a, that is referring to what was shines forth as I am I. That 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 one infinite whole that shines forth as I am I. That is at all times the portal, the substance, the import of the word called I. What I actually refers to is only that fundamental awareness. Because of the exclusion of our non-existence, even in sleep, which is devoid of I. Here, when he says devoid of I, nanatra uh, tukatum, he's talking about the I there means ego. In sleep, there is no ego, but we don't cease to exist in sleep. That's why he, uh, that is, he, it's a very poetic way of saying it, because of a non-exclusion of our non-existence in sleep. That means because we do not cease to exist in sleep, even though sleep is devoid of ego, um, what the word I always refers to is only that that one infinite whole that uh, appears as I am I. I am nothing other than I. That is the true import of the word I. In other words, I refers only to I and not to anything other than I. Um, and then in the next verse, he says, uh, um, Verse 22, since body, mind, intellect, life, and darkness. In other words, since all the five she's are jada and asat. Jada means they're not aware. And asat means they, they don't exist, they're unreal. Uh, they are not I, which is sat. That is, when he says I, which is sat, nana, uh, satana nanala, it implies satana nanala and uh, chitana nanala, because I is not only sat, but also chit. Um, um, so the, 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 the five she's, they are not chit because they're jada, and they're not sat because they're asat. So none of these things actually exist. They only seem to exist, and they're all objects. That is, all the five she's, whatever five she's, this physical body, obviously it's an object. The life in this body, the, the breathing and the, uh, and the breathing and the digestion, all these physiological functions, which are uh, indicators of life, they are all uh, they're all objects perceived by us. The mind, with all its thoughts and perceptions and memories and feelings and so on, it's an object perceived by us. The intellect and the workings of the intellect is an object perceived by us. The will, which consists of uh, of um, of vasanas, they're all objects perceived by us. We we perceive. The, our inclinations to think about this or to attend to this or that. And we perceive those inclinations rising in the form of likes, dislikes, desires, attachments, and so on, and as everything else. But, uh, the vasanas of the seeds that give rise to all, all not only the other four sheaths, but the whole uh, universe is nothing but uh, a projection of our own vasanas. So, these five sheaths are not I, because what I am is only sat and chit. These are all uh, jada and asat. Um, and then he, he, he refers to, he, though he doesn't explicitly refer to jada here, to, sorry, to chit in this verse 22, he refers to it by implication, by, talk, by saying these other things are jada and, uh, and asat. And then, therefore, not I, which is sat. And the implication, uh, yes, chit is very clearly implied there. So, in the next verse, he explains why is is sat chit. Why why is sat means what is? It's just being. Uh, chit means uh, awareness, but not awareness of things. That's the pure awareness. So, uh, what Bhagavan says in verse twenty three. He doesn't use the term sat and chit here, which are Sanskrit terms. He uses Tamil terms in this particular verse. The uh, Tamil term he uses is uludu. Uludu um, means what is or what exists or that which is. Um, it can also mean being. Um, it has it, it, it has both meanings. Um, uh, so uludu is sat, and he chit. He the term he uses is a, a Tamil term. Uh, unavu. Unavu means awareness. Um, so he said, what he says in this verse is, unudu unara, to be aware of what exists. Unavu verin mayin, because of the non-existence of another awareness, um, unudu unavahum. 
Undipara, Unive Namai Ulam Undipara. Here, this is, this is um, a very simple but very uh, deep and important argument Bhagavan gives here. That is, to know what exists, there is no awareness other than what exists to know it. But if there was, if what knows what exists was something other than what exists, it would be non-existent. So the, 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 the very fact that we are aware of existence, of being, we are aware of our own existence as I am, show, shows that, uh, that sat and chit, being and awareness are not two different things because if, if they would, if, if awareness was something other than existence, it would be a non-existent awareness, in which case it couldn't be aware of anything. So awareness cannot be anything other than existence. And if existence was something other than awareness, it wouldn't know its own existence. So it would be known by something other than itself. Anything other than uh, what exists is what doesn't exist. It's non-existent. So existence and awareness are one and the same thing. Therefore, he, Bhagavan says, Uludu unavahum. What exists is awareness. And what is that awareness that exists? Unave na mai ulum. Awareness is ourself. So we are not only awareness, we are also what exists. In other words, we are, we are being. We are what, we, we are existence itself. We are awareness itself and existence itself. So our real nature is not doing, but only being. Uh, so all these implications are there. And then in verse 24, he, he talks about irukumiyakayal, in their nature as being, in their being nature, in their existing nature, isa ji vergal oruporle ava undipara upadi unave verundipara. By existing nature, God and soul are just one substance. That means in their essential nature, which is just being, being and by implication uh, knowing, because uh, sat and chit are one and the same, God and soul are just one substance. What is that one substance? Sat chit. Uh, that is the uh, uh, being that is awareness of the awareness that is being. So uh, that is what God and soul, they're both just that one substance. What makes them seem different? Upadi uh, unave veru. Only the adjunct awareness is what makes them seem different. So only because of our awareness of ourself that I am this or I am that, that's what makes us seem to be different from God. If we were aware of ourselves as just I am, then we would be aware of ourselves as God. And then verse 25, he says, that therefore, since it's adjunct that makes us seem different from God, that seemingly separates us from God, he therefore says, knowing oneself, um uh uh tan vitu overdu tan um uh tan isan uh tanne unavadam undipara tanai olivadal unipara knowing oneself leaving aside adjuncts is itself knowing God because God shines as oneself. And then we come to verse 26, where he wraps up all that he he summarizes all that he said be, before. So how can we that is, in order to attain liberation, we can't attain liberation by doing any action. We can attain liberation only by knowing ourselves. But how to know ourselves? Only by being ourselves. So, tanai iritale, tanai aridlam. Being oneself alone is knowing oneself. Tani rendatradal undipara. Because self is, is devoid of two. They're not two selves. There's not one eye to know another eye, one self to know another self. There's only, we are one. So we can know ourselves only by being ourselves. And what one thing are we? We are awareness. That awareness which is what actually exists. In other words, that awareness of being, that awareness of being is what we are aware, is what we refer to as I am. Our, our awareness of our own existence, that is what I am refers to. So I am refers to such it. That is what we actually are. So it's only by being what we actually are, by being such it, that we can know such it. Um, so tanai iritale, tanai aridla. So this is a this is summarizing the whole message of Upadesha India. 
And the whole import of Bhagavan's teachings is not by doing anything that we can attain liberation, only by being as we actually are. And in order to be as we actually are, we need to know ourselves as we actually are. Because being ourselves is knowing ourselves. Therefore, knowing ourselves is being ourselves. I mean, we can take it both ways. Um, so knowing ourselves as we actually are is being as we actually are. How to be as we actually are? Only by turning our attention within. Because so long as we're aware of anything other than ourself, we have risen as ego. Because what is aware of other things is only ego. Our, our real nature is pure awareness, which is awareness that is not aware of anything other than itself. So only by being aware of nothing other than ourself can we be as we actually are. That's what Bhagavan implied in verse um, in verse uh, 8 and 9 of Upadesh, of Upadesh Rundi, which I talked about earlier. In verse 8, he talks about Ananya Bhava, meditating on what is not other, meaning meditating on oneself. In verse 9, he says, by the strength of that Bhava, by the strength of that self-attentiveness, being in Sat Bhava, being in, being in one's true being, that is uh, supreme, that is uh, 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 the, uh, the, um, the essence or the import of a, uh, the reality of pure awareness, of, 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 of parabhakti, of supreme, of, of supreme uh, love, supreme bhakti. So uh, all these verses, if we understand the, the, this common thread running throughout them, it's, they're all tied together so neatly and so perfectly. And um, Bhagavan con concludes this verse by saying, Tanmaya uh, nishte uh, idundi para. Nishte, well, in Tamil it's nite, um, but that nite is a Tamil form of the Sanskrit term nishta. Nishta means, uh, literally, it means standing or being steady or being steadfast. Um, uh, in other words, it's often translated as abidance. Tanmaya, tan. Tanmaya means tatmaya. Tat is a Sanskrit term that means that. It's referring to Brahman. Uh, maya, tanmaya means, uh, literally means composed of that, consisting of that. So, uh, tanmaya nisha means being only that, being nothing but Brahman. We are always only Brahman, but when we rise as ego, we seem to be Brahman plus adjuncts. So being just as Brahman, there's nothing, there's shedding all the adjuncts and just being as we actually are, that is what is meant by Tanmaya Nishta. Some people misinterpret, not, it's, this isn't a serious misinterpretation, but it's, it, it, is, it is actually incorrect. Some people take Tanmaya because in Tamil, Tan means oneself. Uh, um, tan is, is the... Um, is the inflectional base of, of, of tan. That is, when tan takes case endings, as in tanne, for example, the base of the, of the inflected forms of tan is, uh, is tan. So some people take tan maya to mean uh, the, uh, composed of oneself. In other words, they take it to be uh, the tan as referring to oneself. We are self attacked, that is, touch from us, we are that, but uh, grammatically, that is, to understand it correctly, this tanmaya is a Sanskrit term. In Sanskrit, tanmaya means uh, composed of that, it, it, it's consisting only of that. It's referring to, touch refers to Brahman. So it's here, we, sh we shouldn't take this tan to be the Tamil tan, it's the Sanskrit word tat. Because uh, tanmaya is a very common term, and it always it always refers only to being as Brahman, being of the nature of Brahman. Um, maya it means consisting. You know, that is the suffix maya, as in, for example, in the koshas, uh, anamaya kosha means a kosha consisting of uh, food. Uh, pranamaya kosha, the kosha consisting, the chief consisting of life. Manamaya kosha, the kosha consisting of mind. Vijnanamaya kosha, the kosha consisting of intellect. Anandamaya kosha, the kosha consisting of happiness. Um, so maya, that suffix maya means uh, composed of or uh, consisting of that. 
composed of that. So Tamaya Nishta means being as Brahman, abiding as Brahman. So being ourself is not only knowing ourself, it's also abiding as Brahman. Um, and it's knowing God also, because God is nothing other than Brahman. Uh, so long as we see ourselves as something separate from God, Brahman, God seems to be something separate from ourselves. But when we know ourselves as we actually are, we thereby recognize that we and God are nothing but Brahman. So that's why Bhagavan says, Tanmaya Nishta. Um, so uh, I've gone through all the verses of Upadesha India today. Um, the next verse he talks about uh, when he's not specifically talking about being. Um, 28, he's talking about um, verse 28, very clearly he's talking about being. When one knows the nature of what the nature of oneself is, then anadi, ananta, akanda, sat, chit, ananda. So sat, chit, ananda is not a doing, it's just sat, being. So it's it's beginningless being, uh, 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 endless, infinite being, and uh, unbroken being, and uh, uh, the same uh, that being is itself awareness, which itself is happiness. And um, in twenty nine, Bhagavan says, being in this state, but this in this uh, 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 being in the standing in this state or being in this state. Uh, uh, thereby experiencing the supreme bliss, the void of bondage and liberation, is being in the service of God. So he's again emphasizing being. How do we serve God? Not by doing anything, by just being as we actually are. That's the way to serve God. And uh, in the final verse, he talks about uh, uh, I ceasing if one knows what remains. In other words, if one knows what is, uh, Yilvadu means what, what is. Uh, Yuvudu means, uh, well, it means what remains, but it implies what exists, what actually is there, what is permanently there. That alone is good tapas. So throughout all these verses, that is a, a, a thread running throughout all these verses, is that to know what we actually are and be what we actually are, the means is not doing anything, but only being, being as we actually are. And how can we be as we actually are? Only by Ananya Baba, by attending to nothing other than ourself, by being so keenly self-attentive, but the mind thereby subsides and we remain in that state of being. So this, this 26 is tying together so, uh, so many verses. It, it, uh, it's a very crucial verse and but a very, very important principle. We can know ourselves only by being ourselves. That is, we can never know ourselves as an object. That is what we actually are is pure awareness. Pure awareness can never be an object. Pure aware, we can be no pure awareness only by being pure awareness. We can know pure being only by being pure being. We can know pure happiness only by being pure happiness. So knowing ourselves, so being ourselves alone is knowing ourselves. Thank you, Michael. All right. Um, I don't know if I've not left much time for questions, but uh, no, that's all right. Um, <laughs> so I want. Uh, um, I think you spent quite a bit of time, which is actually important, um, to to differentiate action based yogas from just being. Yes, and that is um, that is important. I mean, uh, I because to... people continue to get pulled even after coming to Ramana Center, they continue to get pulled. Um, towards all the things that they've been used to yeah. um, before coming here. Um, and I can see the struggle. I mean, it, it's different for different different people who come to our center. And they, uh, I could see the fight going on within them. You know, they, they, their pull is there. And, and that is why it's spending that much time to say why doing is not being. Yes. And then you also stressed the problem with doing, because every doing, every action, it's got a wasana. So if you do pranayama, it's going to create that vasana. Yeah. So if you do um, puja, japa, dhyana, it's going to create that vasana. And, you're going to yeah. just, and that's going to just continue. I mean, it's good in certain ways, but it's and got its own problem. If you do self-inquiry, which is not a doing, you create sat vasana. Right. <laughs> so that is sat vasana is the being vasana because 
Self-attentiveness is not a doing, it's a state of just being. That is, the more keenly we attend to ourselves, the more ego remains subside. That's what Bhagavan clarifies in verses 8 and 9. By, by an, the strength of Ananya Baba, it, what happened? We remain in the state of you know, Sat Baba. Sat Baba means the state of being, which is Bhavana Tita, which is Bhavana that we can take as mental activity. It, be, it transcends all mental activity because it is just being, not doing. Right. Um, it, it may seem at first, when we begin to practice self attentiveness, that we are doing something. But actually, self-attentiveness is not a doing, it is a cessation of all doing. Right. So long as our attention is moving away from ourselves towards anything else, that is doing. When our attention turns back towards ourselves, it's thereby resting in its source. So it's, 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 it's bringing all doing to an end. In order to, that is the ultimate true teaching is just, is summa irapadu, just be. Exactly. Uh, but how to just be, we have to ref just be implies being without doing. How to refrain from doing, because the very nature of ego is doing. We can, we can refrain from doing only by clinging to our own being, clinging to I am. So oh, and I, one, one thing I wanted to say in this co connection, that is, it is a... It's an ancient tradition in, uh, in Tamil Nadu, but the ultimate spiritual instruction is sumiru, just be. Right. That is, that, that, that's the ultimate. What are we to do? Just be. That is, um, and um, I think that dates back to Tirumula, even earlier, that uh, term sumiru. And that is um, particularly famous in Tamil Nadu because of the, the very popular story of Arunagiri Nata, who is one of the greatest saints of Tiruvannamalai, who, um, who had, in his being uh, the son of a Devadasi, in his young age, he had lived the life of debauchery. And when he became disgusted with his, um, with his uh, life of debauchery, and he wanted to, he climbed up to the top of the temple tower in, uh, in Tiruvannamalai, that's so the middle tower, the second tower we come through uh, when we're entering from the, from the main entrance. Um, he climbed up to the top of that tower and he prayed to Lord Muruga. I have lived such a sinful, such a wretched life. I, this body doesn't deserve to live. But you saved me. He's not praying for the salvation of his body. He's praying for the salvation of his soul. With that prayer, he jumped off and Lord Muruga uh, caught him. And uh, the instruction he gave him was summa iru. So that's uh, just be. Um, and then he told him to sing in praise for him. He became such a great poet. Um, but that's all another story. The main thing is just, uh, he said, just be. Bhagavan is always very, very economical in his words. So when Bhagavan said to Tine Swami, when Bhagavan gave instruction to Tine Swami, he didn't even say sumayiru. He even dropped the sumayiru. He just said iru. iru. That is, that's a very beautiful and very important story, the story of Kenai Swami. That is, he, he had, um, he was a, a biochemist, uh, working in, uh, Madras Medical College. And he, um, in the late 1940s, he came to know about Bhagavan and he visited Bhagavan a few times. And then there was um, a, an opportunity for him to go to America. That is, there was a research fellowship or something in Duke University in America. And he was, um, he, according to seniority and according to his um, expertise, he was selected for that, to go for that. And he was due to go, but due to some political influence, someone junior to him in the department, pulled some strings and had the, had, had it changed, but that person was to go instead of uh, Tene Swami. So as a matter of principle, but this was obvious um, corruption and nepotism or whatever. So um, as a matter of principle, Tene Swami at once resigned his job. Then he told his, his uh, wife, I'm going to go and spend some days in Tiruvannamalai. I know there's a job opportunity 
in Pondicherry, in Pondicherry uh, um, Medical College. And Tine Swami, he, he, he not only knew his, he was, he was born in Tamil Nadu in, in Coimbatore, so he knew Tamil. But he was from a, Brahmi, uh, a Telugu Brahmin family, so he also knew Telugu. And he, of course, he knew English, but he not only knew these languages, he knew several other languages. He had several Indian languages. He'd also learned French when he was uh, studying in uh, Trichy. He had studied French just on the side. I mean, his main subject was biochemistry, but out of interest, he had studied French. So because he knew French, that would come in, he, he'd be with his with his expertise in biochemistry and his knowledge of French, he would he he was fairly confident he'd get that job in Pondicherry. So he came and he stayed for some days with Bhagavan. And during that time, that was the longest day he had there, he and Murugana became very close friends. Um, and um, then when it was time for him to go to uh, to go for the interview for that job, he came to Bhagavan to take leave. Generally, when people go to Bhagavan to take leave, but one will say, well, no, we'll give his consent. But very unusually on that day, Bhagavan said Iru. In the context, Iru just means stay or wait. Other people in the hall may have thought, oh, this is a bit unusual, Bhagavan telling him to wait, but there must be some reason. Maybe, maybe it's, it's not going to be a safe journey, so Bhagavan will tell him to take, take the next bus or something. People may have had their own imagination. But what Bhagavan meant by Iru was understood only by three people, by Bhagavan himself, of course, by Tine Swami, and the only other witness who was there in the hall when Bhagavan said this, who understood what happened, was Murugana. And it was Murugana who later told this to Sadhuam. That is, though superficially Bhagavan was saying Iru, Iru means, literally means be, but it's often used in the sense of wait or stay. So in the context, it would normally be taken, oh, Bhagavan is telling him to stay. But because Tine Swami was a very mature soul, that one word, Iru, transformed him. That is that when Bhagavan said Iru, his attention turned within and then and there, um, he merged back into his source. That one word of Bhagavan, Iru, was so powerful. So Bhagavan's teachings are all about just being. Because we are not as mature as, as uh, Tine Swami, we need more, uh, we need things to be explained. Of course, Tine Swami had read, uh, he was Tamilian, he was well educated, so he'd read uh, Nana and he'd read, uh, he would have read all of Bhagavan's works. That's why he was so devoted to Bhagavan. Um, but uh, that, that final opening of his uh, inner eye was all that was needed was that one word. And Bhagavan said, Iru. He, he turned within and subsided in that state of being. And he was lived in that state of being. Uh, well, for the of him, I mean, he was permanently established in that being, eternally established in that being. Then the uh, course of life of his body uh, was just in our view. But we saw him living uh, uh, an extraordinary life of uh, complete uh, indifference to the world. But that's a, that's a very, very important story. And it's yeah, only yeah. thanks to Murugana that we know that. Because Murugana was the only other person who was present who understood what happened. Right. And he, because he knew Tine Swami, they, they'd only very recently become, to become friends, but uh, he would have recognized what, uh, what caliber of uh, aspirant uh, Tine Swami was. So when Bhagavan said Iru, and he saw the complete transformation that, went, that happened in, um, in Tine Swami. Uh, Murugana very clearly understood what, how powerful that one word that Bhagavan, uh, said by Bhagavan was. So Murugana often used to tell this story. Yeah. Um, and you wrote an article on Tine Swami in Mountain Path. Yes. Um, if anybody wants it, I have a PDF of it. I can just share it with me. Yeah. Michael wrote an article on this. Um, and it, uh, yeah, uh, when I was saying that when you were, when you were explaining the story of Tine Swami, it was kind of emotional for me because you know, I've been to his Samadhi and it's a very powerful, quiet place. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I just wanted to make a couple of quick comments before I move on to the, the questions. Um, 
the the phrase tanir and atradal um to, to me it's i found it to be very practical a lot of times when i you know um try to be and when thoughts come or when you try to like analyze <laughs> hey, i'm doing it so this is one phrase i just tell myself to remind that hey that is a two right now going on you have to stop um so you know yes, we, uh, we, we are and... self attentive we are not attending to an object yeah we're attending to a subject who am i it's only our self we are attending to when we first come to uh, because we are so accustomed to attending to objects at first we may start even if we if, if our understanding isn't deep enough we may first start um unintentionally looking for some sort of object what is what is this where where can i find the eye or many right. people say oh i can't find the eye i look but i can't find the eye the eye that says i can't find the eye is it so the eye but it's too, it, but we need to attend to there are no two eyes there's only exactly. one eye tanya and dr dal it's a, so powerful. as you say that's very very important Yeah, it's a very powerful knowing and, uh, anything other than ourselves is an action because it requires a movement of our attention away from ourselves towards something else but knowing ourselves is not an action because it's just our attention is resting in its source that is our attention doesn't move away from ourselves it just remains as it is as we are being right um and in in that um along those lines i know you you know reading your uh, essays and writings and and you know hearing your talks a long time one thing i observed is um the way you portray the word or write the word self um you know you don't use the upper case <laughs> yes um for self but rather you prefer to say one self um you know um and that i think that itself is is an expression of how strictly you're interpreting this that there are no two there is no yes, two yeah, exactly, and exactly. um and i i might have been influenced by it, but now when i look at you know when at the word self with an upper case yes it's sort of it's <laughs> it it implies as though that is something different yes, right yes, yes, yes. um and, and you know it's just not comfortable with it anymore yeah the self it, it becomes um this uh this brings to mind verse um verse 33 of uh, ulu napadu uh in, what bhagavan says in verse 33 of ulu napadu ene ariyenan ene arindeinan enno nahi uh, nahi puku uh, idanaham that, that means saying i do not know myself i have no myself is ground for ridicule in other words whether we say i know myself or i do not know myself if that is ground for ridicule um uh, because there is no two any why but one himself asks why any uh uh um um tane vidyam aka irutan undo are there two selves to make uh, to, to make oneself an object are there two selves is, if if our self was something other than that is uh, there are no two selves to, for one self to be an object known by the other self there's only one self and then he ends by saying um uh on on dry a neva anubuti unmeal uh because being one is the truth the experience of everyone we all experience ourselves as one so how can we how can we ever know ourselves as an object we cannot know ourselves as an object we can know ourselves only by being ourselves and when we remain as ourselves there's no question i have i have known myself or i have not known myself who says i have not known myself those who 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 still take themselves to be the body in a, even when we mistake ourselves to be the body we still know ourselves because that, that is in the false awareness i am this body the real awareness i am is shining there the real awareness i am is what illumines that false awareness i am this body so we can never we can it can never be true that we do not know ourselves we may not we may know ourselves as something other than what we actually are but we are always knowing ourselves 
So that is ground for ridicule, to say I've not known myself. And to say I have known myself, that is also ground for ridicule because as if it's something that at one time I didn't know myself, now I have known myself. It is, we always know ourselves. That's why Bhagavan often used to say, jnana is not a new knowledge to be attained. Jnana is our very nature. We are jnana mam tane me. One self who is jnana alone is real, he says in verse 13 of, of uh, Uligunapadu. So, jnana um, <coughs> um, is not a new knowledge to be attained. All we need to do is to remove the false knowledge. The false knowledge is ego. The, uh, the false awareness of ourself is I am, I am this or I am that. That needs to be removed. And what remains then is the pure awareness I am. So how to remove it? Only by being that I am. How to be that I am? Only by attending to ourselves. Because so long as we're aware of anything other than ourselves, what is aware of other things is only ego. That is, whenever we're aware of anything other than ourselves, we're aware of ourselves that I am this. That is something other. But so, so it's only when we rise as ego that we're aware of other things. In sleep, we don't rise as ego. Therefore, we're not aware of anything other than ourselves. So in order to be as we actually are, we need to cease being aware of anything else. But merely ceasing to be aware of other things is insufficient because um, uh, we, we cease to be aware of anything else in sleep. But that doesn't bring about the annihilation of ego. In order to bring about the annihilation of ego, we need to cease being aware of other things by being self-attentive. That's why Bhagavan says in verse um, in verse 16 of Upadesha India, which I talked about earlier, he says, Veli vide and victu, leaving external thing uh, or uh, phenomena, external, uh, external objects, the same vidya he uses here. Vidya means vishayam, vishayam means uh, object or phenomena. So all objects and phenomena are external. So you describe them as veli videyangal. Leaving all phenomena, the mind knowing its own form of light. Uh, that is true awareness. Here, veli videyangale vittu is an adverbial clause. The main clause is manum tan ori uru ordele unme unichiyam. That is, the mind knowing its own form of light, that is true awareness. In order for the mind to know its own form of light, that, that is, but, but when we turn our attention back towards ourselves to see who am I, we are thereby, by turning our attention towards ourselves, we are thereby turning our attention away from other things. So we bring about, we, we don't have to separately leave other things. If we try to know our own form of light, that is that pure awareness I am, if we turn our attention within to, to meditate only on I am, that is not the word I am, but on the, the light that is shining in our heart as I am, that light of pure awareness. If we do that, we are thereby automatically leaving external things. Exactly. This is the key. This is the key. And um, when we when we when we know that our form of light, we thereby subside there, and then there's nobody to rise to say, I I do not know myself or I have known myself. Right. There is only being. Right. Thank you, Mike. No doing um, at all. Exactly. And for the sake of completion, um in, in this verse, Bhagavan says, being oneself is knowing oneself. And he stresses it um, in the Sanskrit words by using the phrase Svatma Darshana, and that is seeing oneself. Yes, yes, yes. So they're all yes. one and the same. Yes, yes. Seeing yes. oneself, so being oneself is knowing oneself yes. and seeing oneself. So if we put yes. it together, that's our way to work. What is the verse in Sanskrit I've forgotten? Atma Samstiti, Svatma Darshanam, Atma Nirvayad. Atmanishtata. Yes, right. Um, that, um, how, how to begin? Atma samstitihi. That means being firmly established as oneself, being standing right. as oneself, being oneself. That is seeing oneself. Seeing, right. So we can never see ourselves as an object. We can see ourselves only by being ourselves. Right. And um, 
during your explanation related to the actions uh, related in, in that context, there is a question here. Um, karma should only be associated to mind. And isn't that karma supposed to be ending in the same lifetime? As we are not mind and body, so how is it possible that these impressions, karma and vasanas, are being carried over lifetimes with spirit? Is that pure divine play? Okay. Um, action begins, that is, the, the starting of action is when we allow ourselves to be swayed by our vishaya vasanas, when we allow our attention to move away from ourselves towards any vishaya, that is an action. That is the beginning of all action. So action begins in the mind. But um, we, uh, we, the, the action that is under the sway of our vasanas, the mind begins to act. And under the, it, it's under the sway of, of the mind, the body, the speech and body act. So karma, as Bhagavan says, it's of, there are three instruments of action. Uh, Mind, speech, and body. That's why in verse um, verse uh, uh, four of Rupadesha India, he talks about three types of action: uh, uh, puja, japa, and dhyana. He says these are actions of of uh, of body, speech, and mind. So there are three instruments of action. But it's true, action begins in the mind. All of that it's it's in the mind. But from where in the mind does it begin? From the will. From the vasanas, it's the vasanas that, that when we allow ourselves to be swayed by our vasanas, we are thereby doing uh, 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 karma. Um, what goes from life to life is ego, but ego takes along with it its vasanas. That is, whatever vasanas we've uh, we've accumulated in this lifetime, we take with us to the next lifetime, and over the course of time. Vasanas do change. That is, a, I mean, we can see even in the course of our life, the things that interested us in the past may not interest us now. The things that interested us now may not have interested us in the past. So the vasanas change. That is, vishaya vasanas, the, the vishayas to which we are in, to which we are inclined to attend may change, but the general inclination to attend to things other than ourselves that is the problem. So it's it, the share of vasanas collectively. It doesn't matter what the vishaya is, being inclined to attend to any vishaya is a problem. So it's it's vishaya vasanas. We have to take treat them collectively, right? We have, like an enemy army. We 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 uh, we need to weaken that army. It's a total. It's a total strength of the army. That is, the strength of the army, of the combined army, is much greater than the strength of all the individual so soldiers added together. Like that, it's a, the total strength of our Vishaya Vasanas. That total strength needs to be weakened. We weaken that most effectively by clinging to self-attentiveness. If we don't, if we don't, Weaken the vasana sufficiently. We need to weaken the vasana sufficiently in order to be willing to surrender ego. So we can eradicate ego only after we've weakened our vasanas to a considerable extent. If we haven't weakened our vasanas sufficiently by the end of this lifetime, we the, this lifetime is just a dream. When this dream comes to an end, another dream will start. But in the next dream, the same that is. The dreamer is ego, but uh, it, it brings along with it its vasanas, and everything it sees in the dream is just a projection of its vasanas. But how is that continuity being established from one birth to another? That seems it's, to be. It's, it's the same. Birth. It's the same dreamer. It's what is the What is the connection between the dream you had last night and the dream you're having now? The only connection is you. Oh, the ego. Ego. And of course, you in both states, you have the same vasanas. So right. the continuity is ego. Ego is unreal, but 
what is really meager is that I am, that I am a provider of continuity. Bhagavan, Bhagavan compares um, in, um, in Anmavide, Bhagavan says, I think in verse 2 of Anmavide, if I remember correctly, he says, um, Una uh, Udal Iduve Nanam Enum Nineve. The thought, this body of flesh alone is I, uh, that is Nana Ninevugal Se or Na Enum That is the one thread uh, that joins all the thoughts together. So all our lives, all our dreams are nothing but thoughts. The one thread that connects them all together. It's only this first thought, I am this body. The body may change, but, the, but that which is aware of itself as I am this body is, is the continuity. So the continuity is only ego. And ego brings along with it its uh, vasanas. In older texts, it is said what transmigrates, what goes from one life to the other, is the subtle body. Uh, but that, that's a less refined way of, uh, of understanding it. What Bhagavan says, what goes, what, uh, every life is just a dream. The, 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 the continuity between all the dreams, it's, it's the same dreamer. The dream, one who is, who is projecting and experiencing the dream is the same. What the dreamer takes with it is, is, only it's vasanas, but the vasanas are the seeds that give rise to all the other uh, sheaves. That's why Bhagavan, in two places, he refers to ego itself as subtle body. That is not to be, we shouldn't take that to mean, but, because generally subtle body is said to be three of the uh, five sheaves, uh, pranamaya kosha, manamaya kosha, and vijnanamaya kosha. These three collectively are said to be the um, the a subtle body. And the analysis goes even further than that. They say um, they say you've got the mind and the intellect, and then the pranamaya coach they divide up into five things. There's a or, or they total they make up they make it as 17. They say there are, there are five organs of um or the five sense organs, the five organs of action, and the five pranas, the five um, vital forces. And the mind and the intellect, these 17 make the subtle body. All these descriptions are given in, in Sastras. So when Bhagavan says, ego itself is the subtle body, we shouldn't confuse it with Bhagavan is saying ego is all these, is, has got 17 parts, or that ego is these three kojas. What Bhagavan is, why, why Bhagavan says, he says this in two places. In verse 24 of, of Uludunapadu, when he describes the, what is ego? Um, that it is a chit jadagranti. He says chit jadagranti bandum nupame. Nupame means subtle body. Likewise, in in um, in um, in nana in um, at the end of the fourth uh, the fourth paragraph of nana, uh, uh, what Bhagavan says is. Um, uh, manum epodum or stulite anusarite nikom. The mind, here mind implies ego, the mind stands by always following something gross. That means it, attaching itself to something gross. That something gross, the stula, the stulum that the body attaches itself is to a body. That body consists of five sheaves. Um, and then he says, Taniyai uh, niladu. It doesn't stand by itself. Then he says, Maname sukmasirium endrum, jivan endrum, solapada kiridu. So he, he said, the mind itself, here, mind, here he's not talking about the manamaya kosha, he's talking about the ego. Um, because it's ego that attaches itself to, to the, the, the the stool that the ego attaches itself to is the five sheaves. So Bhagavan isn't referring to the, uh, the manamaya kosha here. He's referring to ego when he says manamaya. The mind alone is what is called sukshma sarira. Why he says it's called sukshma sarira, this is, this is 
upsetting the, the apple cart of all the neat classifications you get in all the Advaitic scriptures. So why does no one say this? Because it is said that the, what goes, what goes from life to life is the Sukshma Sarira. Bhagavan is clarifying what goes from life to life is only ego along with its bundle of vasanas. But those vasanas are the seeds that give rise to the sukshma sarira, what, what is to the other uh, four she sheets. That is the uh, vasanas, the totality of all vasanas is what is called the anandamaya kosha. And that is also called the karana sarira, the causal body, because it's what it's, it's the seed that gives rise to all the other bodies, to the, um, to the other four sheets. And so Bhagavan has, Bhagavan has refined what is, what has been taught in the old text. Bhagavan has, has, has refined it in so many nice ways. And Bhagavan's refinements are very, very practical. Wherever Bhagavan has refined things, there's always a practical implication there. Bhagavan is saying, don't think, don't worry about the Manamaya Kosha, Pranamaya Kosha, Manamaya Kosha. What we have to be concerned about, what is going on from life to life to life to life, it is I, it is this ego. And that ego carries along with it, it's, because it's the very nature of its ego, of ego to have the share of asana. Because ego, the very nature of ego is grasping form. Uru patri undam, uru patri nikum, uru patri undum as he says in verse 25 of Uludunapti. Grasping form, it comes into existence. Grasping form, it stands. Grasping and feeding on forms, it flourishes. So grasping form is the very nature of ego. Because grasping form is the nature of ego, it's the nature of ego to have vasanas, vishaya vasanas, right? Vishaya vasanas means the inclination to grasp vishaya. Those vishayas are the forms that Bhagavan is referring to in verse 25. So if we understand Bhagavan's teaching deeply, he has refined things in such a nice way and in such a practical way. Because Bhagavan, one of the main things Bhagavan is, particularly in Uludunapri, Bhagavan is dinning in. Ego is the root, it, it's a, all problems boil down to ego. Ego is the root of all problems. So all we need to do is to get rid of ego. What is ego? Nothing but a false awareness of ourselves. So in, how can we get rid of this false awareness of ourselves? Only by being aware of ourselves as we actually are. So the nature of ego is to grasp form. Instead of grasping form, try to grasp ego. Let ego try to grasp itself. When it grasps itself, because there's nothing for it to hold on to, because it's a formless phantom, it will subside and merge back into its source. And then what ego actually is, that is the reality of ego, remains shiny as the pure awareness I am. Thank you, Thank Dr. you Harish. Uh, Harish, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Um, going to the next question is actually, there are two questions with a similar theme. So I'll just combine those two. Um, does Sumairu have a different meaning for us in the world? We cannot sit like Tinnai Swami. Can we still be while in the world doing just mundane things? And uh, the related question from another devotee is, uh, Michael, may I ask, how do we simply be when we interact with others in this world or at workplace? Okay. Um, we always are. Without being, we could not do anything. So the, the doing is, is something that is superimposed on being. So truly speaking, we always just are. But now we seem to have risen as ego, so we seem to have um, have distorted our being nature into a doing nature. But even whatever we may be doing, even as a, as an ego, whatever we may be doing, we we are doing it because we are. We we couldn't do anything if we didn't exist. So so being is fundamental. What we now need to do is to shift our focus away from phenomena, away from action, back towards the basis on which all these things appear. Action and, action and uh, phenomena appear on the basis of being. So we are trying to shift our focus away from all these things back onto being. If we shift our, if we are focused on being, 
to the extent that the, 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 the world and the actions are real, they will go on as they are meant to go on. According to Bhagavan, whatever is to be experienced in this lifetime is already determined by prarabdha. So no action that we do in this lifetime is going to change anything. Sometimes uh, we do things and it seems to have an effect, but it has an effect only because that was what was destined to happen and therefore we were made to do that action. But even when we're made to, do, just because we're made to do actions in order to experience our prarabdha doesn't mean that the only force driving our actions is is. God making us act in accordance with Paradha because our will is also making us act. So, um, so we, our aim now, leave, but let the external life go on as it is destined to go on. We cannot change it anyway. Whether we, whether we try to change it or not, it is going to go on as it is destined to go on. And whatever actions by mind, speech, and body, are necessary, are necessary, whatever actions are necessary for our mind, speech, and body to do, in order for the prarabdha to unfold, they will be made to do by God, by Bhagavan. So we can leave the body, speech, and mind to, and their actions, leave it in the care of Bhagavan. We have a, Bhagavan has asked us to do one thing and one thing alone, cling to I am. If you cling to I am, everything else will happen as it's meant to happen. If you don't cling to I am, it will happen as it's meant to happen. The difference is, if you cling to I am, you're happy and peaceful. If you cling to the world, you're, you've got a great headache. Right. So we need to stop clinging to things other than ourselves. Try to cling to ourselves. Everything else will take care of itself. Because it really, it's all happening according to Bhagavan's will. It's all that Bhagavan says in the 13th paragraph of Nana. Um, when that one Parameshwara Shakti, since one Parameshwara Shakti is driving all karyas, um, uh, what does he say in Tamil? Sakala Karyan Galayum, or Parameshwara Shakti, Nadati Kondir. Kondiru Kira Padial. Since one Parameshwara Shakti is driving all karyas. What does he mean by karyas here? Karyas means what needs to happen, what ought to happen, or what needs to be done, or what ought to be done. So everything that, that needs to be done or needs to happen is being driven by that Parameshwara Shakti. So since that is the case, um, um, uh, Namum adaku adangi iramal, instead of we also yielding to it, um, ipidi se avendum, apidi se avendum, ain endru sadi sada chinti pudu ain. Instead of we also yielding to it, why to be perpetually thinking it's necessary to do like this, it's necessary to do like that? We don't have to do anything except cling to I am. If we cling to I am, everything will happen as it's meant to happen. If you don't cling to I am, it will happen anyway. So you know, by not clinging to I am, you're just creating problems. That's why Bowen gives a very nice analogy in the next sentence. Though we know that the train is carrying all the burdens, that is just like the one Parameshwara Shakti is driving all carriers, the train is carrying all the burdens. So when the train is, when we, though we know that the train is carrying all the burden, why should we who go traveling in it, instead of remaining happily, leaving our luggage placed on the train, suffer bearing our luggage on our head? That is, if you're traveling on a train, you may have a, a, a heavy suitcase or trunk or something. Whether you carry that on your head and suffer, or whether you put it aside, and leave it on the train, it's going to reach its de your destination along with you because the train is carrying it anyway. Even if you put it in your head, it's still being carried by the train. You're just unnecessarily creating trouble for yourself. Likewise, uh, carrying the burden of this world on our head is foolish. Everything, our whole life is already 
predetermined by him and it's whatever should happen whatever needs to happen will be made to happen whatever actions our mind speech and body uh, uh, need to do they will be made to do by him leave the whole thing to him or our only duty should be to cling to i am everything else will happen as it's meant to happen so uh, um revisiting is that, that an answer um yeah, uh, one person said yes, and um, just revisiting the question: uh, How do we simply be when we interact with others in the in the world or in the workplace? And the how of it is just just keep keep at it, right? Who is who is it who is interacting with others? To whom do those others and the interactions appear? They all appear only in our view. So. All those things are actions. So whatever appears and the, the interactions, all these things and the others and the, the whole world is all doing. But you are being. So hold on to yourself. Let everything else do as it's meant to do. As it's meant to be. Yeah. Let the, the doing will go on as it's ordained according to Pararabdha. With if we cling to I am, we are not thereby interfering. We're letting the Pararabdha take its course without any interference on our part. If we don't cling to I am, then we are then we are acting we are under the sway of our vasans. We're trying to change this, trying to change that, trying to experience a little bit more of this. Oh, this is very nice. Let me experience some more of this. Oh, I don't like this. Let me avoid this. And so we are constantly under the sway of our vasans. We are constantly doing karmas, but those karmas don't have, do not, in, cannot in any way change what we are destined to experience in this lifetime. So all we achieve by doing those karmas, by acting under the sway of our vasanas, we are, we are creating fresh fruit to be added to, to the already huge pile in Sanjita, and we are strengthening the vasanas that make us do those actions again and again and again. So it's, it's a, Action is self-perpetuating. Because the more we act, the more we strengthen the vasanas, the, the karma va The more we do karma, the more we strengthen the karma vasanas. The more we strengthen the karma vasanas, the more we do karmas. So we've got to break this vicious cycle. How do we break it? Not by doing anything, but only by being. How to be? Only by clinging to I am. So whatever may be happening, whatever our mind, speech, and body may be doing, let us not be concerned about them. Let us try to cling to I am. Um, now, because for most of us, our Vishaya Vasanas are still relatively strong, most of the time we are, act we are, we are being swayed here and there by our Vishaya Vasanas. But at least little by little by little, we need to try to cultivate this uh, practice of um, of being self-attentive, trying to hold on to self-attentive, whatever the body, speech, or mind may be doing. That is, right. who is doing the action? I am thinking, I am talking, I am uh, doing this work or that work. That I is there. So without the being, how could there be any doing? So cling to the being. What is that being? That being is I am. Cling to I am. Just be. Thank you, Michael. Just being um, means cling to that which, which whose very nature is being. That is, I am. Right. Um, thank you, Michael. So there is um, a, a, there is a question here, which is actually a set of three questions. As it is non-objective experience, how will I know or experience when I am being aware of the self? And there are a couple of follow-up questions. By what experience is it a peaceful state of mind? Is the Satchitananda an experience in the mind? So basically, she's trying to say, what is it that experiences um, okay. the ultimate experience you're talking about? Okay. Um, can, can you uh, yeah, so can you uh, repeat the first question? As it is a non-objective experience, how will I know or experience when... I am being aware okay, of the self. Okay, right. You are always being aware. Is there ever a moment when you're not aware I am? The problem is, though we are always aware I am, because we have so much interest in other things, 
instead of attending to I am, we're attending to other things. The, the awareness I am remains, even when we're looking at other things, but we are overlooking it. Now we need to, we need to take interest in this fundamental awareness I am. Give up all your interest in other things, because these other things cannot give you an iota of happiness. You yourself are happiness. That is that awareness I am is happiness. So by clinging to I am, by taking interest only in I am and not in other things, we thereby experience happiness. Um, when we are practicing this path, the deeper we go in this path, the, the change that is taking place is an extremely subtle change. It is a deepening of clarity. That is, we are always clearly aware I am, but because of our outward going, yeah, because of our outward going tendencies, our Vishay of us, because we are allowing our mind to constantly go outwards, there's some sort of a, uh, um, the, the clarity of our being is somehow obscured am among all these, uh, uh, by, by its mixture with adjuncts. The more we attend to I, the more clearly that we, we begin to experience a greater clarity of self-awareness. It becomes clearer to us that we are something distinct from all these adjuncts. That is, all the five sheaths are adjuncts. Now we are so deeply identified with this body, this mind, and everything. But the more we attend to I, the more we become aware of ourselves as something distinct from all these things. The more we're aware of ourselves as something distinct from these things, the more detached we become from these things. That is, the less, the less important these things are. So a very subtle change is taking place. But if we're truly following this path, we will we will have no doubt about this path. We cannot have any doubt about this path because, as Bhagavan said, this path is the path of light. We are following the light, the original light, the light of pure awareness. So the more we turn our attention within, the clearer our awareness of ourselves as just being, not as doing. That becomes clearer and clearer as we go deeper and deeper in this path. Eventually, when the ego is destroyed, we are swallowed by that infinite clarity of pure being and pure awareness, that infinite clarity of Satchit. We are swallowed by that. That alone remains. Then what knows Satchit? Can Satchit ever be known by an object? So ego can never know Satchit. And ego always knows Satchit as I am. But instead of knowing Satchit as it is, it knows Satchit as I, I am this person. So the, when we know, when when, when we know ourselves clearly, ego is thereby destroyed. And what is knowing ourselves is only that pure awareness. That pure awareness alone knows pure awareness. In that state, there can be no doubt. So don't worry. Don't have any. Don't uh, worry about whether you'll recognize it. <laughs> you'll be swallowed by it. You won't recognize it because you as ego will no longer be there. What will remain? Is only I am what you always actually are. What you are, even now, you are only that. You're never anything other than being. How could you ever be anything other than being? How can anything be other than being? Because being alone exists. Being is existence. Nothing. There cannot be anything other than existence. So, so what we actually are is only Uldudu. What is Sat? What what exists? So we are only that. We're never anything other than that. We, but we have deluded ourselves into thinking, oh, I'm this, I'm this person and I'm doing this and I'm doing that. All of this is just a mere appearance. It appears so long as we allow our attention to go outwards. Turn your attention back within. Try to see yourself. Try to hold only on to I am and ignore everything else. Nothing else matters. Nothing else, nothing else can, you cannot, nothing, nothing else can give you anything. Because you yourself are the infinite whole. So just hold on to yourself and lose yourself in yourself. Again, the answer is in this verse, Taan yeah. Yiranda There is no two. There is no two. There is no two. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how, how do I recognize myself? You will always recognize yourself. You're always saying I am. 
But instead of being aware of yourself as just I am, now you're aware of yourself as I am being. That is the problem. Right. And I think I'm mistaking that to be a state of mind because I'm thinking I will have a clarity or like a peaceful or a undist- unperturbed state of mind. But yeah. I am that despite the mind being agitated or depressed or excited. Mind is constantly undergoing change. So sometimes the mind is agitated, some, sometimes it's relatively agitated, sometimes it's relatively calm. Sometimes it disappears altogether in sleep. But these are all states of mind. Mind is not real. What is constant? We are not, we, we are looking for that which is constant because only that which is permanent, that which is constant, is real. What is constant, what is ever unchanging, is only I am. So we don't need the mind to know I am. Because even in sleep, when there's no mind, we clearly know I am. So we need to go beyond the mind. Cease relying on the mind by clinging to yourself. So long as you cling to anything else, you're relying on the mind. We can't know anything else without the mind. Yes. But to know yeah. ourselves, we don't need the mind. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, that's not me crying. <laughs> <laughs> but sorry, he, but... he or she is expressing the sentiments of all of us. This life is. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Wouldn't that's... it be nice sometimes just to cry out like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. See all the things that this life throws at us. Yeah. <laughs> but Michael, but... That really that crying out doesn't solve the problem. If we want yeah. to solve the problem, hold on to I am. Then we will no longer have anything to cry about. But eventually, does that percolate into the mind as a peace, a sense of peace? Yes, yeah, it does. It does. It, it, it gives clarity to the mind. Clarity and purity are one and the same thing. So the more the mind is clarified, the, the more it is purified, because the, the vasanas get weaker and weaker and weaker. So is it is it clarity that is causing purity or, or purity causing clarity? We can't say, but they're really one and the same thing. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank, thank you, you so Michael. Much. Um, so the next, uh, Satya Chilikuri, do you want to go ahead? It's a good question. Go ahead, please. Uh, yeah. From what I understand, if I understood correctly from the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says uh, everybody is always engaged in action, which includes thoughts too. So it's a question of uh, what kind of thoughts or what kind of actions is attitude. So the emphasis should be on attitude rather than the nature of the, the rather than the type of action. Uh, yes, at a more superficial level. But the attitude we want is be attitude. Be attitude means bliss. <laughs> that is, we, we need to give up the attitude of taking ourselves to be a doer. We need to have the attitude, I am just a beer. I am. That is, uh, uh, what we actually are is not doing, but only being. So we need to... What Bhagavan is teaching us is something much, much deeper. He's teaching us to shift our attention away from doing back towards being. Who is the doer of action? Who is the doer of action? The isness is the important thing. It's the being that's important. There cannot be any doing without being. So who is that? What is that which has risen as a doer? What, what is its real nature? What is its being? So we are investigating being, not investigating doing. Yes, so long as mind, speech, and body are there, the very nature of the mind, speech, and body are to be acting. So, but let the actions go on. The actions need not concern us. We are not, that, that is, as I explained, in Upadesh Undia, Bhagavan is trying to, is weaning us off action and restoring us to being. That's the whole, the whole flow of the text of Upadesh India is away from action back towards being. That's the, di- that's the direction in which Bhagavan is leading us. So let the actions go on. 
The, the actions need not concern us. Uh, uh, that is uh, the fruit of past actions that are to be experienced in this lifetime. In other words, everything that we're to experience in this lifetime is already predetermined. Those actions that we need to do in order to experience that, we will be made to do by Bhagavan. So we can leave that to Bhagavan. It's no concern of us. He will take care of that. Our only concern should be just being. How to be? By clinging to being. Being means I am. Cling to your own being, and then you remain in the state of being. And that is Satya. The name itself says it. <laughs> I understand what uh, the attitude I mean is superficial in the sense if we are uh, living in the empirical world, that is correct. There's no such thing as Prarabdha Karma if you look at uh, absolute reality. Yes. It's only in relative reality. Yes, yes. Prarabdha but, Karma. In absolute reality, there's no such thing as Prarabdha Karma. Now, now, because now the are... problem comes, the problem comes most of the time whether uh, all these questions that so far we, you have addressed are conflicts between empirical reality and absolute reality. Because when once we are in the empirical reality, there is apparent duality. Yes. I am using specifically apparent. Uh, yes. Yes. But uh, to overcome, to transcend that appearance, apparent duality, uh, then we have to live in the uh, absolute world or absolute reality. Okay. Yes, but not now it is true. Now we seem to be in this empirical world, in this Vivahara Kasatya. We seem to be in this. But we, 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 we are in this. That is the being. That is, we couldn't be in empirical reality without being. So even when we're in the midst of this samsara, we are being. So there's nothing that there's nothing that can ever obstruct our being. Being is our very nature. So we couldn't be in samsara without being. So forget the samsara. Let samsara take care of itself. Cling to the being. This is what Bhagavan is trying to, to get us. That is the change in attitude Bhagavan is trying to get us to make. But the the Vivaharika Satya, the samsara will go on by itself. Let it go on. It's no concern of ours. Our only concern should be clinging to being. Being is not an object. You yourself are the being. Cling to yourself and let the samsara take care of itself. Samsara is being very well taken care of by Bhagavan. By his grace, the whole thing is going on very smoothly as it should go on. Your only concern you need not be concerned about samsara at all. You need to be concerned only about your own being. Thank you. Now, because of the strength of our Vishaya Vasas, we are still so concerned about this samsara. Our aim now is by to wean our mind off its interest in samsara and to take interest in just being. So how do we do this? By trying to cling more and more to being, to, to our own existence. I am. Thereby the samsara will drop off by itself. And eventually, when we drown back into our source, we will find there never was any samsara. That is the ultimate truth. But for the time being, yes, the samsara it does seem to be here. But in, this is another thing, Bhagavan. In, in whose view does samsara seem to exist? In whose view does Vivaharika Satya seem to exist? It's only in our, the view of ourself as ego. So long as we are looking outwards, all this seems to be exist, and we seem to be ego. But when we look back at ourselves, where is this ego? We can't find it. We can only find I am. Hold on to that I am. And ego and the whole samsara will slip off a lot by themselves. They are sustained by our allowing our attention outwards. They will be dissolved by our holding on to being. So just be. So many that is the whole essence of all of Vedanta is summarized in those two words, Sumiru, or summarized even more neatly in one word, B. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Um, uh, let me go on to the next question here. Um, well, and it pertains to your earlier part of the discussion. 
um, where you're talking about doing anything, simply not being. Um, and so the questioner here is asking, during my practice, I experience a witness watching endless witnesses. Based on today's discussion, these also seem like thoughts. How do I make sense of this? That is... He's witnessing, for, basically. Yeah, yeah. But, but the term witness, um, it is used in different senses. Um, Bhagavan said the term witness can be understood in two senses. Witness in the sense of that which is aware of things, that is only ego. But in many texts, witness is used in the sense not of uh, that which is aware of things, but in the, the that is the, the awareness, the pure awareness, which is the light that illumines all these things, is often referred to as witness. It doesn't mean that pure awareness is aware of all these things. So we need to distinguish that, that is Bowen said. If witness means perceiving, then it's only the witness is only ego. But the deeper meaning of witness is, is Sakshi is Sanadi, Bhagavan said. That is the mere presence of awareness. It's in the presence of awareness that all these, or pure awareness, that all these things happen. But though it happens in the presence of pure awareness, it doesn't happen in the view of pure awareness. It happens only in the view of ego. So, um, uh, because this term is, uh, witness is misunderstood, people try to make a practice out of it. I'm witnessing all my thoughts. Yes, we're witnessing all the, since, since the beginning of, of, of time, we've been witnessing thoughts. That is, the nature of waking and dream, what are waking and dream? They are states in which we're witnessing thoughts, nothing but thoughts. The whole thing, all that we are witnessing is nothing but thoughts. So, witnessing thoughts is not a way of out. We need to witness for witness, attend to the one who is attending, see the seer, as Bhagavan said, know the knower. Yeah. So we are not, that is, when we start talking about witness, we then, if there's a witness, there's something that is witness, we think. And so we, we, we have that, in that sense, when you've got a witness and something that is witness, that is subject and object. That subject and object is the problem. But the, all objects exist only in the view of the subject. The subject is nothing but ego. Ego, we seem to be ego so long as we're looking at objects. So stop looking at objects, look at the subject. Then the subject will dissolve back into its source and then being alone will remain. Right. Um, so like to who does these thoughts Occur, right? If yeah. thoughts what, come, they, whatever they, they, appears, to whom right. nothing can appear except in the view of something. Everything that appears appears only in the view of ego. It appears only to ego. So we shouldn't be concerned about what appears. To whom does it appear? Yeah. This is a very, very crucial teaching Bhagavan has given us. Uh, I just saw one, um, one uh, question there. Mm. Um, Someone asked, any brief suggestion about how to practice sumayiru? Sumayiru means just be. Just cling to being, and that is just being. What is being? You are being. Your very nature is being. So cling to I. In other words, the only way to just be is to cling to self-attentiveness. Because self-attentiveness means attending not to anything other than ourself, attending only to ourself. What we actually are is only being. So the more we cling to self-attentiveness, the closer we come to that state of sumayarupati, just being. Um, that, that is the only thing. There is no other way to just be other than clinging to I am. Right. Because just being is the very nature of I am. All other things are doings. I am alone is being. Thank you, Michael. Um, so finally, I want to, um, Murthy, could you please go ahead? I know you, you were having a chat exchange with um, Deepthi. Uh, could you just summarize that? And uh, if there is a question still, could you please pose it to Michael? Murthy? 
doing goa without uh, hindering the being so michael uh, addressed it actually without being there is no doing so i have to exist so i need to do anything the problem is while the action is going on i'm thinking that i'm doing it when i think that i'm doing it i'm already allowing my separate existence individuality to arise and it may arise directly uh, like in the form i am doing this action and they should succeed and the success should bring me fame or money or whatever or it could arise in indirect form where i am doing this action i am doing dishes but my child is crying i have to go take care of my child's feed so these these are ways in which the assertive individuality arises and whenever the assertive individuality arises we have an implicit ownership of the action we think that i am doing it yeah right and i am doing it is a problem the action is going on due to the instruments which michael nicely listed bhagwan has listed the mind the speech and the body the three act as instruments the other parts we are okay like for example when my leg is facing the steps whether i am intending or i am putting my focus on it or not after three or four steps i have reached the destination the body has reached the destination unfortunately with mind there is also this ownership when mind is doing the thinking and the planning and the executing of an action unnecessarily a thought arises that i am doing it i am planning it i am executing it that is the problem when that arises in a direct or an indirect form the self attentiveness by asking the question who is getting this thought who is having this ownership that will kill that thought and it will allow the action to carry on with mind being an pure instrument as opposed to mind being me so that is where i think the problem all these questions arise you know how can i attend to my self investigation when i am attending to a task in hand that is the typical problem i'm sure michael has faced this question from day one <laughs> and even today and tomorrow also you'll face the same question yeah 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 it, thank it, you it's it's a question for all of us because uh, um yeah, i mean this is something we're all up against even if we've understood this a bit more clearly we still face with this problem exactly but bhagavan said it's bhagavan often said it's all a matter of attention that is so long as you allow your mind to go towards the actions then we 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 i don't because when our attention goes away from ourselves towards other things that is uh, it's only after we rise as ego that our attention can go away from other things we rise as ego by grasping these instruments of action as ourselves so inevitably so long as you're attending to any action you feel you're doing it i am walking i am talking i am uh, thinking i am deciding i am judging i am doing this and doing that is inevitable so long as we allow our attention away from ourselves the only way to break this doership breaking not only the doership but also the experiences ship that is the nature of ego is not only kartrutva but also bokshutva the experiencer so how to break this doership and experiencership only by attending to ourselves so long as we're attending to anything other than ourselves we are the doer and we are the experiencer so the this self attentiveness that bhagavan has given us this is the brahmastra by clinging to self attentiveness it is the only solution yeah the bhoktrutva invariably the cells in our fanciful imagination think about normal actions yeah. when you do dishes for example yeah you might be thinking if i do dishes very well my spouse is going to pat my shoulders and yeah. appreciate yes yeah. or on the other way around you may yeah. think you know what if i don't do the dishes properly somebody is going to be upset with me so the yeah, bhoktrutva yeah, yeah. results in Encouraging and sustaining the doership also, the yes. also. 
they, they're inseparable. It's like the two sides of one coin. So look, exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, um, um, Vine Moodle Namayin, Vine Payan Tweepo. Bhagavan says it very simply. If we have a dual, we'll be the experiencer. We cannot separate the two. But how to separate ourselves? We are neither the doer nor the experiencer. We seem to be the doer and seem to be the experiencer because we've allowed our attention to move away from ourselves. So don't allow your attention to move away from yourself. Hold on to self-attentiveness and the, this, this cycle of karma and the fruits of karma, everything will be severed because you're cutting at the very root. Yeah, actually, practically, if you think, uh, Kumar, uh, when, we, when we do an action, very likely that 80, 90 percent of the time, we are not focusing 100 percent in the action. While doing the action, I'll be thinking about office at home. While doing an action in office, I'll be thinking mostly about what's going on at home and what is waiting for me to do, or I'll be thinking of my travel, impending travel. So we are not really, so this is the person who is thinking 80, 90 percent of the time about other things than what is being acted upon. Yeah. Is asking how can I pay attention to self investigation? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Saying that self investigation will be become a hindrance to my doing. Yes, yes. yes. You're not actually focusing your, your full yes, attention yes, yes, on yes, your yes. past. Yes, yes. So. He, most of the actions we do uh, are going on more or less automatically. <laughs> they, we are involved in those actions only because of our interest in them. Ownership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So it's Bhagavan has given us the, the simple and infallible key to get out of this. That key is self-attentiveness. That is what it's all the Bhagavan teachings are about. They're all prompting us to hold on to ourselves. As Bhagavan said to Deswama, to Akalanda Maya, Une Vidama Liru, be without leaving yourself. That says it all. And, and for me, I can share my experience very quickly and very briefly. Whenever I stumble upon this, wonder about how can I be doing something without, uh, without attending to it? How would I be doing uh, self-investigation while I'm doing an action? When I stumble upon questions like this in my mind, I go back, I go back to whoever said this to me, that is Bhagavan. Yes. Go back to the Bhagavan and say, you know what? What you say seems to be very logical, but when it comes to practicing, I'm not able to do it. How do I do it? And surrendering more and more, going back to the person who is asking you to do it, reveals it, makes it very, very clear. Yeah. More than studying and reading again and again, going back. And there are several instruments and mechanisms for going back. You can chat the verses, you can talk to him, you can. You know, cry to him, plead, and beseech him. There are so many ways. Bhagavan himself has done. Other devotees have also done. That's the best and the most efficacious way to get it clarified for ourselves. Yeah, yeah. There, there cannot be a self investigation without self surrender. And there cannot be, well, our surrender cannot be deep without self investigation. The two are inseparable, they go on hand in hand. All these esoteric and uh, somewhat riddle-like statements and suggestions and teachings will all become clear yes. when our self-surrender exactly. and self-investigation exactly. deepens. Exactly. Even in the working exactly. moments, it will become so clear that it cannot be cannot be anything else. That's yes, the kind yes. of feeling we will have. You know, yes, mind-based yes. feeling is what people are asking for. I can vouch and. My vouching has no meaning because unless somebody experiences, what's the yeah. point in Michael telling, yeah. my telling, Bhagavan yeah, yeah. telling, anyone telling, right? That Doesn't is. matter what our experiences are, what your experience matters to you. So yeah. just believe me, if you don't get it, go to somebody, go to whoever is telling you this is what it is. Go back to them, complain to them, beseech them, tell them, yeah. scold them, talk to them in your language. They yeah. will do something which you will realize that things are yeah. suddenly become clear. Yes, that is the, the deeper we go in the practice of self-investigation and self-surrender, the clearer Bhagavan, the, the clearer Bhagavan's teachings become. That is the, 
um, fresh depths of, of clarity are revealed by our going within. So uh, the same words of Bhagavan that we were reading 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, it, they become more and more clear to us. And the, the depth of meaning and the depth of implication in Bhagavan's words becomes clearer and clearer. It, it, he, Bhagavan's words reveal their own meaning and implication to the extent to which we put them into practice. Exactly. The, so that the response of, to will... the practice yeah, sorry, of self investigation and self surrender is absolutely essential. Absolutely it's, essential. It's, it's so overwhelming yeah. that you, you won't be able to even thank. The yeah. tears will flow from your eyes, yeah. and your mind will be stilled. Yeah. And you won't feel like even saying thank you, O Bhagavan, because yeah. Who is it's so overwhelming. You? Yeah, the, the tears yeah. will flow and yeah, you will yeah. not yeah. you will you will cry like a baby and you yeah. won't be able to even thank. There won't yeah. be a need for you to thank, and that's the yeah. kind of clarity which will set in. I mean, yes. so what is the bottom line is the self-surrender, going back to the teacher, mm -hmm. going back to Bhagavan, complaining, falling at his feet, yeah. telling that look, I'm very sincere, I want to follow. But there are two things. One, I don't understand and I'm not able to practice it. Number two, I'm distracted. Surrender and you see how magically things change. Bhagavan gave a very, very, uh, a very important clue in, um, in um, Ariyati Tarajiva Dahavari Jagwahil Arivai Rami Paramatama Naranachala Ramana. Arunachala Ramana is what is blissfully existing, is the Paramatma, which is blissfully existing as awareness in the, in the cave of the heart lotus of all different jivas, beginning from Hari. Then in the third line he begins, Parival Ula, uh, Ula uh, Uruha, Uruha, with the heart melting with love. That heart melting with love, that is the key to success in this path. Without that heart melting love, we cannot succeed in self investigation or self surrender. That is the absolute key. It's only when our heart melts with love that we will be able to enter, the, enter that cave and lose ourselves in that. And then the eye of uh, awareness will be opened and it will be revealed to us. So that heart melting with love, that's such important words Bhagavan has used in that verse. Actually, if you think about it, uh, we all know that Bhagavan will not lie. Right? Yes. Bhagavan is a person who would not lie. Yeah. Bhagavan was very good in doing the kitchen chores, yes. as it is recorded by many devotees. Yes. Yes. And when he did kitchen chores, he did them perfectly. So when Bhagavan says actions will go on without your thinking that I'm doing it, he means it yeah, and he yeah. has done it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bhagavan, we all agree, was a realized sage when he could do chores and he says the action can going on can go on without uh, losing the, the, the being, mm. it must be true, it must be possible. Yeah. And what is possible if I'm not getting it, go back to Bhagavan. Yeah, exactly. That's the only option we have. Yeah. So that's why we have sung 108 verses of Arunachal Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Over your heart and not even a single verse is asking for anything worldly. You can yeah. check that out. Yeah, yeah. Not even a single verse. Is. In fact, he says, you spoiled my life. Yeah, yeah. I lost yeah. my life over Arunachala. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there is so much instruments he has given for us to go back and cry yeah. to him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Murthy, yeah. <laughs> Um Any, uh, I think we, with that we will conclude um, today's um, session. Thank you, Michael. Um, I think uh, next uh, month, September, we will be looking at um, verse twenty-seven. Right. Okay. This is all. This verse is all about we. The next verse, he goes back to knowing again. <laughs> <laughs> because being and knowing are inseparable. They're one and the same. Sat is chit, chit is sat. 